Hello, everyone, and welcome to Addressing Attitudes and Science Mistrust During the COVID-19 Pandemic. We have a great program for you today, but before we get started, I'd like to go over just a few items with you. First, the audio has been disabled for all attendees. If you'd like to ask a question, you can do so at any time by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Selected questions will appear and will be addressed by panelists during the moderated portion of this program. Please note that this session will be recorded and that you can choose to ask questions anonymously in the Q&A. Live Spanish interpretation is also available today by clicking on the interpretation button at the bottom and selecting that channel. Closed captioning is also available for the session. Click on the closed caption button at the bottom of the screen and click on show subtitles to view live captions. Furthermore, Spanish captioning is also available via an external browser window. Um, the, the link is on the screen, but a clickable version will also be made available in the Q&A. Last but not least, for technical support, you can type questions into the Q&A, or you can email the address on the screen, nnlm-scr at unthsc.edu. Thank you again for attending and participating in today's conversation. Without further ado, I am turning it over to Dr. Vishwanatha. Thank you, Brian. Uh, can I share my screen, please? All right, one second. Uh, I welcome all of you to this uh, webinar on a very important topic, uh, important current topic. All of us have in one way or the other uh, suffered through the effect of the COVID pandemic. We have uh, navigated through uh, daily changes in what is happening with the pandemic, uh, all the way from uh, starting to think about therapy, prevention, therapy, as well as uh, developing a vaccine. And then we navigated through how to participate in uh, the therapeutic trials and the uh, uh, vaccine trial. So we are now at a stage where the vaccines are, but then there is a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of uh, mistrust uh, uh, with regarding to the therapies and the vaccines that are available. So today we have assembled an expert panel, uh, people who have been involved in various aspects of response to the COVID pandemic. Uh, so we uh, are very grateful to our panelists who all are very busy people, but they are contributing their time uh, to come and address this uh, audience here. Uh, but before we get started, I would like to uh, greatly appreciate uh, four people who have put in a lot of time and effort in organizing this, uh, Brady Burns, uh, Brian Leaf, uh, Damaris Javier, and uh, Molly O'Brien, all four of them uh, who are part of uh, uh, the four uh, important constituents are sponsoring this meeting. Uh, you will see at the bottom of the screen, the Community Engagement Alliance uh, at the National Institute of Health, the Network of the National Library of Medicine, uh, the National Research Mentoring Network, part of the NIH Diversity Program Consortium, and the Texas uh, Community Engagement Alliance Consortium. So I thank all of the organizers uh, for supporting this uh, meeting. I would especially like to thank all of the speakers who, uh, like I said, are very busy people. They uh, have uh, contributed their time to this. Uh, so to enable this webinar, I'm going to introduce uh, a moderator, uh, Anna Kuchment. She kindly agreed to moderate the session as well as the question and answer at the end. Anna is a staff science writer at the Dallas Morning News, and she's also a contributing editor at uh, Scientific, uh, Scientific American. Uh, previously, she spent 14 years as a reporter, writer, and editor for the Newsweek magazine. Uh, her work has been recognized by the National Association of Science Writers, the Society for Features Journalism, and the American Geophysical Union, and is included in the 2018 volume of the Best American Newspaper Narratives. She's an author of uh, The Forgotten Cure, The Past and Future of Phage Therapy, which was published in 2011. She's also a co-author of the forthcoming Shaky Ground, the untold story of the largest earthquake surge in modern history. That book about earthquakes linked to oil and gas production 
is due out next year. Anna is also particularly interested in uh, what COVID-19 pandemic has uh, had an effect on our communities. And I'm uh, very happy that a busy person like her will uh, be moderating this session. So with that introduction, I would welcome uh, Anna uh, to continue the session today. Thank you all for participating and uh, I look forward to questions from you or uh, to the panelists. Thank you so much. Um, it's such an honor to be with you here today. And thank you, Dr. Vishwanatha and your team at UNT for your work in this incredibly important area. Um, we at the Dallas Morning News have been closely following the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 has had on our Latino and Black communities in Texas. Last month, we partnered with researchers at UT San Antonio and the Brookings Institution to report that Latinos in Texas have lost a staggering 241,446 life years to COVID-19. Uh, that's life years. Um, that's more than twice as many life years as white Texans. That's because members of the Black and Latino community are far more likely than whites to die in the prime of their lives from COVID-19. Among those ages 25 to 64, the COVID death rate for Hispanics in Texas is more than four times as high as that of non-Hispanic whites. Blacks in that age group are dying at more than twice the rate of whites. Of course, misinformation, mistrust, and lack of access to healthcare play into those staggering losses. And I'm really looking forward to learning more about this from all of you today. I wanted to add just a few more words about trust. Local news organizations like ours and scientists and researchers like all of you are among people's most trusted sources of information. That means there are great opportunities for us to all work together to combat the societal issues that COVID-19 has placed into such stark relief. With that, I'd love to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Torrance J. Steptoe is a physician and co-owner of Precision Pain Solutions, a division of APW here in Dallas, Fort Worth. Born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Dr. Steptoe attended Morehouse College and earned his medical degree from Meharry Medical College in Nashville. He then completed his anesthesiology residency at Temple University Medical Center and his pain management fellowship at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. He is double board certified in anesthesiology and in pain management. He is a life member of the Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity and is a member of the Texas Medical Association and of the Dallas County Medical Society. Thank you for being with us and over to you, Dr. Steptoe. Thank you, Anna. I just want to make one correction. Um, I currently now work for the past four months now with uh, Trend Healthcare, which is a multidisciplinary um, medical practice with my primary office being here in Hearst, Texas. So how do I get to be on the panel with, um, with my esteemed colleagues? That is a question that I don't really have the answer for other than I was invited. Someone heard me speak um, last week and so here I am. And so trying to, I have been given the uh, task of addressing the mistrust specifically within the American, within the African American community of science and the healthcare system. And so I think if you put a hundred African Americans in a room and pose the question, why do you why do you mistrust or have so much distrust of science and the healthcare system? Probably 90% of the answers would have something to do with the Tuskegee Syphilis Institute study. Excuse me, Tuskegee Institute Syphilis study from 1932 uh, on to 1972. But in addressing the mistrust and the, the differences amongst the races and the ethnicities, I have to start with a story of personal experience during my practice of anesthesiology. So I've been in practice here in, in, in Dallas Fort Worth for approximately 20, almost 23 years. And so maybe 15 to 18 years ago, I got um, given the task to take care of an early 70s to mid 70s white female who had a fractured hip. 
and I was going to be providing anesthesia services for her for her surgery. And in the pre-op area, it's me looking through the chart, getting acquainted with her medical history, her previous surgical history, her medications, her labs, her EKG, her x-ray, um, discussing the anesthetic options and, and then answering questions. And after we decided on an anesthetic plan and we were just about ready to head back to the operating room, her husband said, well, doc, I have one question. And I said, yes, sir, what is your question? And he said, well, I've always wondered, do black people bleed the same color blood as we white people do? And I stepped back and I looked at him and I, I was waiting for him to smile and laugh, but he was dead serious. This, this was something that he really wanted an answer to. And I said, well, sir, we have, yes, we do bleed the same blood. We have the same, um, our blood types are under the same ABO classification as yours. And as a matter of fact, if you were in an emergency situation and needed to have a blood transfusion, I could be the one to donate blood for you to save your life. And I said, and after that, I said, um, and I will take excellent care of your wife. And she looked at him and said, of all the questions you could have had answered, this is the thing that you most needed to know at this very time. So now why is that important? Why is that story relevant? In the late 1800s and early 1900s, there was a study conducted in Oslo, Norway with latent syphilis amongst um, white males in, in that country or in that city. And so now we can put up the, or you have the slide up. So in 1932, the um, US public health system um, sanctioned a study at Tuskegee Institute and it was conducted by several primary investigators along with the help of a nurse who would now be considered the clinical coordinator, nurse uh, Eunice Rivers. They studied 600 black men, 399 who had latent syphilis and 201 who did not have the disease. The men were told, they were enticed, I'm sorry, by being given free meals, um, free medical examinations, and they were also given burial insurance, which were all enticing factors to say, yes, okay, we'll go ahead and participate in the study. So now in 1932, there was no cure for syphilis. They were trying treatments such as using mercury rubs and bismuth, and they were having limited success. Along with that limited success, there are also toxic side effects and even potentially fatal side effects from those treatments. Now let's go to the, yep, you're on the right slide. So in 1945, penicillin was discovered as a cure for syphilis. And in, by 1947, it had become the drug of choice. So you would think up until 1947, the treatments that the men in the, in the study were receiving, well, that's maybe the best they could get. But after 1947, when the drug of choice was available, these men who participated in the study did not receive penicillin. And that's where we start running into the serious ethical, bioethical um, violations. So now this study continued for another 30, 40 years. It went from 1932 to 1972 until a whistleblower essentially brought attention to the, um, to the country of what was going on and the, the study was eventually halted. So now that brings me to the bio, biomedical ethics. So in 1979, after the study, a man by the name of Tom, Todd, excuse me, Tom Beecham and James Childress published the first edition of the principles of biomedical ethics. And so there are multiple principles of ethics but three basic bioethical principles were violated with regards to the Tuskegee um, experiment. Number one was the respect for autonomy. So with the respect for autonomy, participants were not fully informed in order to make autonomous decisions as to whether or not they would participate. The next principle is non-malfeasance. 
Participants were harmed because treatment was withheld after it became the standard of care or treatment of choice. And the third principle violated was justice because only African-Americans were studied. So again, let's go back to my, to my original story that I shared. This gentleman that I was getting ready to take care of his wife, he wanted to know if, if African-Americans or Blacks had the same color blood. We had this study in, in Norway where whites who had contracted syphilis had been studied. And now we have Blacks in Macon County, Alabama who are being studied to see if we have the same side effects and same course with the disease as the whites do. And this Tuskegee syphilis study has been cited as arguably the most biomedical research, excuse me, the most infamous biomedical research study in American history. And I, again, I started off with, this is where the mistrust comes from. And now what do we do to try and correct that? Well, just as our moderator just shared, we have to get out useful information. And so now, Previous panels that I participated in, I get bombarded with questions about what are the side effects? What if I get a fever? What if I get a rash? Um, what if I have body aches? What if I have to miss work? Well, what about the 400,000 plus Americans who have died who don't have those alternatives anymore? I guarantee you they wish they could take a vaccine that was not fully FDA approved, but was noted to be 95% efficacious. So in previous talks, I've said, what is your alternative? So right now, if you get really ill and you come to the hospital and you require supplemental oxygen, then they give you supplemental oxygen. If your oxygenation or respiratory status is even more dire, they intubate you and they put you on the ventilator. And we have therapeutics out now or that have been that have been coming out to try and mitigate some of the symptoms but i would summarize it with this if it gets to the point to where everything that we know to do to help you is no longer working all you have then is our thoughts and our prayers we hope you make it through the night we hope your loved one does not die we are doing everything that we can but it's out of our hands. And so we have a vaccine that is effective. And so I would say, you know, my closing remark is everybody, when you get the opportunity, get vaccinated. I received my second injection of the Moderna vaccine um, three days ago, and I'm doing well. And that concludes my discussion on it. Thank you so much, Dr. Stepto. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Shi Hong Lin. She is Professor of Biostatistics and Coordinating Director of the Program in Quantitative Genomics of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and she's Professor of Statistics at Harvard University. Dr. Lin's research interests lie in development and application of scalable statistical and computational methods for analysis of massive genetic, epidemiological, and clinical data. She is an elected member of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Lin is the PI of the Outstanding Investigator Award for the National Cancer Institute and the contact PI of the Harvard Analysis Center of the Genome Sequencing Program of the National Human Genome Research Institute. She has been active in COVID-19 research. She is a corresponding senior author of the landmark JAMA and Nature papers on analysis of the Wuhan COVID-19 data on transmission, public health interventions, and epidemiological characteristics. In spring 2020, Dr. Lin served on the state of Massachusetts COVID-19 task force and testified in the UK Parliament's Committee of Science and Technology on COVID Responses. Welcome, Dr. Lin. Uh, thank you so much, Anna, uh, for the very nice introduction. And also, I want to thank the organizer for inviting me um, to, to speak today. Uh, I would like to share with you a uh, work on vaccine hesitancy from analysis of 30,000 subjects of the How We Feel project. Next slide, please.
the how we feel project was launched in April uh, last year, and so the the app can be downloaded from Apple Store or the Google Play. So this was in partnership with, with many volunteers and especially Pinterest. And so the this app collects information of self-reported health exposure and also behavior data. And um, by early January, and uh, so the this study has over. 570,000 users and also 15 million responses. We published last summer in the Nature of Human Behavior, the first uh, paper out of how we feel studies. And so on the symptom, uh, COVID symptom behavior and the testing result. Uh, next slide, please. Vaccination program, especially vaccine, uh, distribution, deployment, and the uptake is the defining challenge in 2021. To achieve vaccination-induced herd immunity, it's important to overcome vaccine hesitancy. In this end, last December, early December, and How We Feel project implemented a question on vaccine uptake. So in the analysis, we define the acceptance as very likely or likely, and the hesitation as very unlikely, unlikely or undecided. And earlier this week, in the interview, and Dr. Fassi emphasized the importance of getting over vaccine hesitancy in order to combat COVID-19. Next slide, please. So here is a demographic of the uh, how we feel vaccine studies. In one month, by early January, and uh, after the the question was implemented, we have totally about 2,900 uh, respondents in U.S. Among them, 80 percent are females, and 20 percent are males, and also about 84 percent are white, 2 percent are Asian, 3 percent are African American, 5% are Hispanic Latino, and 4% are multiracial group, and 2% others. And to come back COVID 19, so uh, we would really appreciate help to distribute the app to increase the diversity of the user base to help the, to make the, uh, the user base more representative of the US population, especially helping under uh, those uh, who are vulnerable. Next slide, please. So the figure on the left in the top that gives the number of respondent distribution at the state level across US. And in last earlier last year, and we established a partnership with the state of Connecticut. So that's why you can see that there were more respondents in the state of Connecticut and also in California as well. And there's a Bottom uh, figures on the left shows the percentage of vaccine hesitancy rate at the state level from the How We Feel studies. As you can see, that the, uh, the, the southern state has a higher hesitancy, hesitancy rate. On the right, and that shows the distribution of vaccine preference. And so, as you can see, the overall um, among those 2,900 people, about 18% showed vaccine hesitancy. Among them, 11% are undecided group. This is an important group that education outreach effort can really help. And also, one can see that about 82% and, uh, uh, are likely or very likely to take the vaccine. So that is a good news. Next slide, please. Our study also showed people of color are more likely to be vaccine hesitant. So as you, so here is the distribution of vaccine preference um, by uh, racial ethnicity. And so you can see among white, 15% were vaccine hesitant. Among black, you can see that percentage is much higher, 46%. And uh, um, Hispanic is 30%, Asian 21%, Multiracial and other groups are 21 and 26 percent, and those are much higher than the white. And also in each group, you can see that there's a high proportion of um, undecided group. So this group is particularly, and the, the outreach uh, would be helpful. And uh, as Dr. Tiptoe nicely summarized, there's a many historical reasons for the, for the uh, vaccine hesitancy among African Americans, and the, including the medical uh, mistreatment and distrust. Uh, next slide, please. We also found 
healthcare workers and essential workers are more likely to be vaccine hesitant. So as you can see that among non-essential workers, 16% were vaccine hesitant. Among the healthcare worker, 21%. Among the essential worker, 24%. And so we all know that healthcare worker and essential worker, they are vulnerable. And this, but they are more likely to be, vac uh, to be hesitant, vaccine hesitant. And also you can see there's a large proportion of people uh, who are undecided. So therefore the vaccine outreach and educational effort will be very valuable. Next slide, please. So this slide shows that the areas with a higher cumulative COVID burden have a higher vaccine hesitancy rate. On the left, the Y axis is the percentage of vaccine hesitancy rate at the state level calculated using the how we feel samples. On the x-axis, this is a state level cumulative case rate from COVID tracking. And the, on the figures on the right, the x-axis is the state level cumulative death rate. And so as you can see from both figures that the vaccine hesitancy rate increased with the uh, cumulative COVID burden at the state level. Uh, next slide, please. So here is a vaccine hesitancy uh, regression result using multiple logistic regression. This vertical bar is a reference at ratio equal to one. So as you can see that the females is almost twice more likely to be vaccine hesitant compared to male. And younger people are more likely to be vaccine hesitant compared to older people. And the essential worker and healthcare worker, they are more likely to be vaccine hesitant. And also followed and the job seekers are more likely to be vaccine hesitant. And the people of color, including African-American, Hispanic, Latino, Asian, multiracial, they are more likely to be vaccine hesitant. Especially Black people are 3.5 times more likely to be vaccine hesitant and than white. And also people with um, pre-existing medical conditions, they are more likely to be vaccine hesitant. And also people who are parents and also the low incomes, and they are more likely to be vaccine hesitant. People in the rural areas and also in the south, they are more likely to be vaccine hesitant. And also people living in the region with more COVID burden, such as the region with a higher cumulative case rate and the death rate, they are more likely to be vaccine hesitant. And the one good news is that people who wear masks and all and use protective measures, they are less likely to be vaccine hesitant. And next slide, please. So there are some limitations of the how we feel data. And the user base are more females and also more white users. And also the user base may be biased towards those being more COVID aware. And so we would expect the total population may have higher proportion of vaccine hesitancy. So even in, the, in this group of people who are more COVID aware, we still see the strong association between the um, people of color and people at social economic status who were more vaccine hesitant. And so we are currently doing a justice analysis using census weight to account for the bias sampling. And the first look of the data do not dramatically change the result. Next slide, please. So here are the major takeaways and the groups who are more likely to be vaccine hesitant, including people of color, healthcare workers, essential workers, younger individuals, females, areas with higher COVID burdens, and followed uh, job seekers, people with pre-existing medical conditions, parents, lower income, and also people not exhibiting protective behaviors. Next slide, please. So what's the next? This tell us that tailored and multifaceted educational and outreach effort are needed to improve vaccine uptake by addressing those concerns, especially from vulnerable communities, because the different communities, the concern may be different. And to this end, we are implementing several additional questions and material, including reasons of vaccine 
a vaccination, no vaccination, and whether a person has been vaccinated. If a respondent is a parent, the likelihood to vaccinate their children and also ma uh, educational material. So community engagement at all levels with all stakeholders is important for the success of public champion effort. It's really take a village to combat a COVID-19 uh, and also vaccine hesitancy. Next slide, please. So I want to acknowledge all the um, my collaborators. So this work is led by my postdoc, John McCabe, and also multiple collaborators across multiple institutions and how we build teams. We will be more than happy to help the CEO in any way we can and to combat COVID-19 and also address the concerns of the community of uh, vaccine hesitancies. And also we'll be grateful if uh, the the app can be distributed and so therefore we can have more users and uh, especially from underrepresented minority and also at social economic dis disadvantages and so the result can be more representative of the u.s population and also help those vulnerable groups thank you thank you so much dr lin um, our next speaker is Dr. George Mensa. He is a clinical a clinician scientist who currently serves as the director of the Center for Translational Research and Implementation Science <clears throat> at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, which is a part of the National Institutes of Health. In this role, Dr. Mensa leads a trans NHLBI effort to advance late stage translational research and implementation science to address gaps in the detection, prevention, treatment, and control of heart, lung, and blood diseases and sleep disorders, and the elimination of related health inequities. His goal is to maximize the health impact of scientific advances. Dr. Mensa is an honors graduate of Harvard University. He obtained his medical degree from Washington University and trained in internal medicine and cardiology at Cornell. His professional experience includes more than 20 years of public health service at the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the NIH. In addition to his public service, Dr. Mensa had 15 years of experience in direct patient care teaching and research at Cornell, Vanderbilt, and the Medical College of Georgia. Dr. Mensa maintains active collaboration with several international groups to advance research on the global burden of diseases and risk factors. Welcome, Dr. Mensa. Thank you very much, Anna. And um, I want to express my real deep appreciation for being included uh, on this panel. Um, what I would like to do uh, is to share with you four main themes so that by the time I'm done in my um, eight to 10 minute presentation uh, that you would remember those four things. Now, there's gonna be a test. Uh, and so here are the four things. So the first is the NIH has several major initiatives that are addressing the COVID pandemic and I'll tell you about four of them. That's the first uh, information. So you should know those four initiatives by name. The second is I want to focus on one that is addressing community engagement and outreach so that we can address misinformation and mistrust. Uh, and then the third is to let you know that we are so fortunate. We have a fantastic SEAL team in Texas uh, and that you would connect, uh, led by Dr. J.K. Vishwanatha and his team. Uh, and there's a lot of work that we can do together and we're hoping that we connect. And then uh, the fourth, I wanna emphasize uh, the three C's when it comes to vaccine hesitancy. Uh, these are building and boosting confidence in vaccines, uh, addressing complacency, and then uh, addressing convenience. And finally, uh, I'm delighted that Dr. Brennan is on the panel with me. Uh, she's one of the major leaders at NIH supporting uh, all of this work. And to let you know that at NIH, we are willing, we are eager, and we are ready to work with you and your families and communities to make sure that we can promote health. Next slide, please. So here are the four major initiatives, just to select four, for example, and I've highlighted them in yellow so that you remember for the test. Um, the first one is active 
uh, and that's uh, an unprecedented major public-private partnership that is designed specifically to speed up and accelerate the development of treatments and vaccines for COVID. Uh, uh, if you send me a note, if you haven't read about it, there's a wonderful paper in the New England Journal of Medicine that the NIH director himself led in writing. So it's important for all of us to know about it. The second is to say that in addition to the NIH wide effort around active, every institute has specific initiatives also addressing COVID. And one example is CONNECTS from the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute. And this is putting all the networks that we have funded in the past, bringing them together to say all hands on deck, let's address COVID so we can speed up the development and identification of treatment and treatment strategies. So uh, that's the second. Then the, uh, the third is a major uh, NIH effort. Um, we've talked about treatments, we've talked about vaccines, we've talked about studies, but there's also testing. And the RADx, which is a rapid acceleration of diagnostics, uh, is designed to specifically address uh, testing. And then the final one that I'll spend a little bit more time on is our Community Engagement Alliance, what we call SEAL. And this is the SEAL Alliance addressing COVID-19 disparities. Uh, we fund 11 states, I'll, tell, um, I'll tell you about them. But before I do that, in the next slide, I wanna show you how complex the RADx uh, initiative it is. It's addressing uh, innovative point of care tests a uh, test that you can use at home, uh, and certainly uh, uh, a test that uh, 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 both traditional, but also really innovative non-traditional approaches. But the one that I wanna highlight because it has relevance for everything we're talking about today is the importance of testing for COVID in the underserved populations, the racial and ethnic minority populations that have been heavily and disproportionately impacted. Uh, that Dr. Stepto uh, mentioned. Next slide, please. So here is the NIH SEAL program. Uh, and in the box in the middle, uh, it shows you that it's NIH wide, which means the 27 institutes and centers are supporting uh, this effort. Uh, and what do we do? We focus on using community engagement and outreach uh, so that uh, uh, we can promote and boost inclusive participation, particularly in the racial and ethnic communities that have been disproportionately impacted. Uh, we begin first with establishing partnerships or strengthening partnerships that already exist in the community, using that partnership to grow an understanding and a trust in science. We've heard about the importance of mistrust and there are legitimate reasons why communities would, um, would have mistrust, but we need to recognize, acknowledge them and address that mistrust. And in that effort, help to accelerate the uptake of beneficial treatments, whether those treatments are drugs or they are vaccines. But the most important thing is every step of the way, recognize and address misinformation, mistrust, skepticism, so that we can really promote uh, the uptake of uh, effective treatments and vaccines. Next slide, please. I wanted to share with you uh, where we are operating, and these are the initial uh, 11 states where we're able to form this community engagement alliance, but our work doesn't stop only in those states. Everything that we've produced from communication tools, toolkits, all that information is available to anyone uh, throughout the United States. But in these states shaded blue, we have the SEAL teams that are working with those communities. And we are hoping that you take advantage of the wonderful team in Texas, uh, but any other information uh, you have, if someone is listening from another state that is not highlighted, you reach out to us and we would help. And it's not just a group of researchers is these researchers and their longstanding partners, their community-based organizations, their healthcare centers and uh, providers, their faith-based organization partners, uh, and local health departments and state health departments, as well as pharmacy networks. 
So all the entities in communities, especially those that are trusted messengers who can help us get the word out so that most of, uh, uh, of us uh, can take advantage of these effective treatments uh, and vaccines. Next slide, please. La siguiente I, diapositiva, por favor. I'm sorry if someone could translate for me, please. A ver, sí, por supuesto, estoy aquí traduciendo, señor. Oh, okay. Um, um, the, uh, I still didn't understand my Spanish is ver, not that. Perdón. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it, sir. I'm yes. interpreting for you. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. You Can came you through. I, I, I thought you were giving me a message. So that, that's, that's okay. So I will continue this slide. Muy bien. Entonces, con esta diapositiva. This slide is to show that es... vaccine hesitancy is really important. Uh, the, 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 the way we interpret risk and how we act on it comes in many, many different uh, forms. And the real importance of this slide is we have to be patient. We have to meet our communities where they are, try to understand where the hesitancy is coming from so that we can Tienen provide trusted information. Para que that nosotros information podamos proporcionar uh, una información que a lo que ellos... Next slide, please. Uh, the, the, the three themes highlighted at the bottom are the ones I want to emphasize and to let you know that we are ready and eager Para to provide truthful saber de que information, ya estamos... uh, accurate information, help educate trusted voices, make sure that the trusted messengers who can carry the mes messages have the information they need. So don't think you, you need to do this all by yourself. We can provide you the tools, the toolkits we have found to be useful so that you are ready to engage in your communities. And the whole purpose in number three is to share this very, very widely. Next slide, please. I want to end with some good news. There's no question that the work we have to do still exists. We have a lot of work to do, but there is good news. And the good news is that if you take a look at the results published by the Pew Research Center, si there has been ver, an increase. Ha habido realmente un aumento. There has been an increase in the proportion of individuals who now say they are willing to accept the vaccine. Now, 60% um, going up from 50% uh, may not seem that great, but what it tells us is if we're able to get our messages out more, uh, and build these partnerships, we're likely to get to be even higher. Uh, if you look in May uh, to September, for whatever reasons that happened, we had a drop in the number of people who said they were willing to take the vaccines down to as low as 50% or 51%. Now it's up to 60%. Let's work harder and harder so we can get to 80, 90% and higher. We are all optimistic, but it's going to take partnerships, it's going to take trust, and it's going to take what uh, the communities told us we need to move at the speed of trust. Next slide, please. The takeaway message that I want to emphasize is that vaccine hesitancy can change, as you heard from the first two speakers, but that change requires community engagement, it requires outreach, it requires building trust, and it requires making sure that there's an understanding of the vaccine process and always, always, always sharing truthful information. Next slide, please. That's my final slide. And I'll end by saying at NIH, we are just delighted with the work that's been done in Texas and in the other SEAL team states. And please know that we are ready, we are eager, we are willing. Uh, to work with you and your communities so that you make the appropriate informed choice and help promote health in your communities. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much, Dr. Mensa. I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Um, we welcome uh, Dr. Patricia Flatley Brennan. She's director of the National Library of Medicine at the National Institutes of Health. In that role, she oversees the world's largest biomedical library and a $100 million data science research portfolio. 
Dr. Brennan guides the NLM's efforts to accelerate data-driven discovery, engage library users in new ways, and develop a data science workforce. A pioneer in the development of innovative home care information systems, Brennan previously was the Lillian L. Molman Bascom Professor at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Brennan. Thank you very much. I want to uh, thank Dr. Vishna Vishwanatha, sorry for the name, for the invitation, and also my colleague, George Mensa, with whom we spent many hours preparing the NIH's response. The National Library of Medicine stands as a partner to support the SEAL initiative during this time of the great need to improve the public's engagement. George mentioned information is essential, accurate information is essential, but information alone is not enough. I'm gonna talk with you today about some of the things the National Library of Medicine does that may surprise you. Next slide. Uh, the National Library of Medicine is part of the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. We're about a half a billion dollar operation. Our strategic goals are to accelerate discovery and advance health through data-driven research, to reach more people in more ways to enhance dissemination and engagement, and to build a workforce for data-driven research and health. Next slide, please. Our library is as much about our people as it is about the place, the building we have in Bethesda our workers, but also our public partnerships and public information gathering that helps us know what kinds of information resources are necessary for the public to have. At this point in time, the National Library of Medicine employs almost 1,700 women and men. And in addition to that, we're engaged in the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, which is about 8,000 points of presence around the country. That's where the important part of addressing vaccine hesitancy and scientific mistrust comes in. Next slide, please. On our website, we can point you to many resources that the National Library of Medicine and the National Institutes of Health have related to the coronavirus and the COVID-19 pandemic. Many of our resources are used by researchers to investigate and interrogate this viral sequence and to understand how it's mutating. In addition, though, we provide a number of other resources, next slide, please, that include public access to the biomedical literature with PubMed, our citation repository, and PubMed Central, our full text literature repository. In addition, we've started to make preprints available. Preprints are a new kind of publication at making information accessible quickly. And the CORD-19 literature repository resulted from a partnership with the National Library of Medicine and publishers around the country to drop the paywalls and make it possible to access information directly. We provide information directly to the, the general public in our Medline Plus resource, which is a lay literature, lay language approach to health information in English and Spanish, and also Medline Plus Connect, which is a way that links your electronic health record which with our patient level information. We provide open data, access to the genomic sequence. And as I indicated, the network of the National Libraries of Medicine provides us with points of presence. Next slide, please. Importantly, we do a lot of stuff behind the scenes to make information integrated and accessible. We are updating all of our public terminologies with COVID concepts to make sure that if a patient needs information about COVID, they're able to find, sort through our vast array of information resources, linking behind the scenes, computer connected information using our special concepts and terms. In addition, these concepts and terms help us match patient level information with clinical records so that you can have for your patients information flyers handed specifically to their particular information needs and their language preferences. Next slide, please. As I indicated, the network of the National Libraries of Medicine is our field force. We offer funding for small level projects in the community, increase engagement. We expand professional knowledge, helping librarians and others know how to best use our resources. And we support outreach to promote our products. Next slide, please. The network of the National Library of Medicine is divided into seven regions. You see those regions on the slide in front of you. Each region is anchored by a regional medical library that engages member librarians in a, in a number of projects. 
The regional medical library is usually at a, a university. The public libraries, hospital libraries, specialty libraries, federally qualified health clinics that consist of, uh, participate as our members get locally level resources. In addition, the network provides special programs both to librarians and directly to citizens, including a research data source, RD3, specialized information about HIV AIDS and substance disorders, partnership with the NIH's critical projects such as the All of Us or the HEAL initiative, the Health Ending Addictions Long-Term. We provide engagement with students and also with citizen scientists. In addition, our data coordinating center, our coordinating centers around the country assist with some of the features that make our operation run better. Get in getting access to articles through DocLine, web services and training, and public health coordination. Next slide, please. We have specifically partnered to support SEAL teams around the country, as you see on the map here. This is similar to the map that George has just displayed to you. Next slide, please. The important thing to understand is that the National Library of Medicine's National Network of Libraries of Medicine is a way of working in the community with the community, particularly as we respond to this crisis. We recognize that information alone, whether it exists in Bethesda, in our stacks, or on the internet, is not enough, and we need the person engagement to make information actionable for individuals. With our national network participants, we are able to respect local resources, making sure we understand and leverage and build on these. In addition, we understand local values and we engage the local networks to communicate to the community. We respond to local concerns because the needs of South Texas might be quite different than the needs of South Boston. And we support the development of locally relevant materials. Next slide, please. Here's an example of one of the projects that's going on right now. We are in the literature library infrastructure project to support literature access during emergencies. The National Network of Libraries of Medicine has developed a way to make sure local libraries that may be closed can still get public, still get into the hands of the public information that's necessary for the community. This helps doctors and nurses, practicing clinicians, and family members get access to information to look at the impact of library closures on the health of the community, making sure that we are able to assess secondary factors that may, may disrupt an individual's ability to take care of himself or herself with information. Next slide, please. Specifically to the COVID-19, next slide. We are addressing several information outreach activities and those you see on the screen here in front of you. The, we have funded in the Houston area, the Black Girl Health Foundation, Luke's House at the clinic in New Orleans, the University of Texas Oz Arlington facilities, the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences and the Pottsboro Area Library. Each of these gets a small grant from us proposed by the local community to do something that's relevant specifically to a small group. These grants are in the size of about 10 to $15,000 each. Next slide, please. I wanna leave you with my personal commitment that the National Library of Medicine stands as a partner with the SEAL initiative to provide trusted health information to the community when they need it in a format that is accessible and understandable. If you have guidance for me, thoughts or ideas of how we can help you, please try to reach me. My email address is on the screen, patty.brennan at nih.gov. You can follow me on Twitter and you can also read my blog that comes out every Wednesday morning. Thanks very much for your interest. Thank you very much. Anna. Thank you so much, Dr. Brennan. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Allison Gammy. She's director of the Division of Training, Workforce Development and Diversity, which supports the National Institute of General Medical Sciences Research Training, Career Development and Diversity Building Activities. Prior to coming to NIGMS, she was a senior lecturer at Princeton University, where in addition to teaching, mentoring, and running a research lab, she served as an academic advisor and associate member at the Cancer Institute of New Jersey and the director of diversity programs and graduate recruiting. 
honors include her honors include Princeton's President's Award for Distinguished Teaching, the Graduate Mentoring Award, and the American Society for Microbiology Hinton Award for advancing the research careers of underrepresented minorities. Thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today. And I think we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, some of the issues that trainees have been facing um, during the time of COVID. And just to give you a little bit of context, um, in the division that I run, um, we have over a thousand awards, um, and those go to um, over 300 different types of institutions across the country, ranging from um, the community college level up through um, the most uh, research active institutions in the country. Um, in addition, we support over 7,000 um, trainees each year, um, usually with uh, financial assistance and often with tuition remission. And so for that reason, we do hear a great deal about what's going on. I do wanna say that this is more of a qualitative presentation, so we don't have any quantitative data to share with you, but this is just um, some of the things that the students have been experiencing. So a lot really depends on the career stage. So um, at the undergraduate level, um, we're finding that not all students have access to quiet environments in order to um, do their studies and their research. Um, many students don't have reliable internet if they have it at all. Um, sometimes they're trying to do their schoolwork and their research on their, on their telephones. Um, Another challenge is that um, it's really difficult. Sometimes classes are synchronous and participation is required, um, but we have um, individuals who are across a range of time zones. So they may be attending school in one part of the country, but actually for COVID they're, they're at home on the other um, opposing time zones. Um, I think one of the things that's hardest about it, um, this is that we, we, these are research training programs. And so research is at the center of all of these training programs. And many of the undergraduates are not being able to participate in authentic research experiences. They may try to do some type of remote research, but as we all know, it's not quite the same as being in the laboratory and getting that, that excitement um, that it comes from doing uh, authentic research. Um, on, the, on the personal side, we're hearing a lot about anxiety and depression, and I don't think that's, that's, uh, that is true across the country for all of us, <laughs> um, but particularly so for many of our students. Um, so at the undergraduate level, a lot of our programs are diversity enhancing programs, um, which means that many um, of the individuals are from underrepresented groups or um, are socioeconomically disadvantaged. And so we all know what happened this year for, for people who um, were, the, the health disparities of COVID would just really laid bare um, the problems our country has with health disparities. Um, many of our trainees' um, families are frontline workers. Um, and then you put on top of that um, the, the racial justice issues that occurred um, this summer, which are you know, called on a lot of people of color to have to um, speak up at a time when they were experiencing a number of, um, of challenging issues. Another obvious thing is people are worried about their safety and the safety of their family. Um, and then on top of that, um, just economic issues, having food and shelter insecurities. And we certainly have had anecdotes of where an undergraduate's stipend is the only financial source coming into the family. So that's sort of at the undergraduate level. At the graduate, postdoc, and early career level, um, one, of the, one of the biggest challenges is a severe interruption of research and their research training and all of the anxiety that goes along with that. Um, in addition, many are parents of young children, so they're doing childcare, they're, they're teachers to their children, and they have a full-time job. Um, many are caring for sick and elderly family members, um, some have had at the later stage of the pathway have had job offers that fell through. As you know, institutions experienced um, a lot of financial um, problems with COVID and they had to rescind job offers. Um, as with the undergraduates, there's also um, anxiety and depression we're hearing about. Obviously some of the same issues I've already mentioned, but on top of that is there's a lot of anxiety around extended time to complete their training. So we know that graduate programs are already very long as our postdocs and the worry is that that will extend even longer. Um, and I think there's a lot of anxiety around um, job prospects as well and when will 
when will um, colleges and universities start hiring again? So those are just a few things. Obviously, there's a lot more going on, but um, those are some of the things that we're hearing from our trainees. And um, with that, I'll take the questions at the end of the panel. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Amanda Roberts. Um, Dr. Amanda Linnell Roberts is an epidemiologist specialist intake team lead and intake team trainer at Tarrant County Public Health in Fort Worth, Texas. As an epidemiologist, she is applying her leadership and scientific expertise in combating the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Roberts earned her doctoral degree in biomedical sciences with a concentration in visual sciences at the North Texas Eye Research Institute at the University of North Texas Health Science Center. Dr. Roberts is a mentee and ambassador for the NIH National Research Mentoring Network. She supports science education and college career readiness in the North Texas communities by participating as a mentor for Arlington Independent School District Coaching Up Program and a science instructor for Crowley Independent School District After School Program through UNT HSC Diversity. To help students succeed in math and science during the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, she became the co-founder of the Building Academic Confidence Organization. Her organization provided free virtual tutoring in science and math to elementary and middle school students. In 2020, Dr. Roberts partnered with DMV National Society of Black Engineers Junior to lead the Art of Communication workshop that provided a dynamic virtual experience for all NSBE junior scholars while engaging in discussions, exercises, and activities in real world situations. Dr. Roberts plans to continue to inspire the next generation of STEM leaders and promote diversity and inclusion in biomedical research. Welcome to you, Dr. Roberts. Thank you. Next slide, please. So today we'll be talking about the effects of COVID-19 pandemic on underrepresented mentees. COVID-19 has affected so many people and in unrepresented students, it has effect in several areas. Next slide, please. When students are responsible for research projects and when the pandemic came, there was some problems. Well, there was limited access to the research facilities or even worse, no access at all. As a result, this led to research projects being postponed or even canceled. Individuals who were getting ready to graduate may have not be able to graduate due to having an obligation to publish a paper or finish a project and um, causing more stress and anxiety. Next slide, please. As we all know, a lot of the students were forced to leave campus and go back home. And this actually increased responsibilities for some of the unrepresented students. This has led to an increase in um, worrying about their health as well as their family's health because they, they, they didn't know if they were um, exposing their family to any sickness. Some individuals also have to become caregivers for relatives, whether it be um, young or old. In addition, if an individual in their family have lost their job due to COVID, as we noticed it's happened in millions of lives, these individuals that went back home now not only have to finish the, se the semester at home without resources from school, but also have to find a job to help provide for the family. Next slide, please. Now, not all students have access to internet at home. In addition to that, they may not have access to a laptop. There are great resources on campus to where you can check out a laptop. However, um, if you're at home and you don't have a laptop, 
that can be a problem to completing assignments, to listening to a lectures. In addition, some individuals do have internet. However, they may have um, low, low um, connection. As a result, they may miss important vital information that professors are talking about. In addition, there are great resources that are available on, on campus to help them through their courses. However, it's not available at home. Students with student health care and mental health care um, on campus are not able to have access if the universities do not have virtual health care um, resources. Individuals who need one-on-one -on -one tutoring to take classes, to pass a quiz, pass a test, may not be able to um, get the help they need and to focus due to being at home and having that one-on-one -on -one interaction, as well as the interactions and the interruptions that may be at home. And as we all know, um, the changes that's been happening, a lot of the students, they've chosen a certain career, but unsure what's gonna come next. So the guidance for the next step is um, a scary. Next slide, please. Now, not all students went home, but some stayed on campus, but they were not um, protected from the, from the changes that were, that were difficult. A lot of the organizations and club gatherings were canceled. And the importance of these organizations and clubs is to help these students to develop and improve their communication skills and networking skills, as well as leadership. Many of the science conferences were canceled. Journal clubs, seminars were postponed or canceled as well. And those are very important um, opportunities for networking, for to meet the next, the next their next boss or their next research opportunity. But that being canceled, then that becomes a problem. In addition, there's also that not all students are comfortable taking, taking their lectures and their labs on the computer. As a result, they're losing great, um, resor great resources and skills are needed in order to continue on with a biomedical research career. Next slide, please. So what can the university do to help? Well, the university can create virtual workshops and seminars. And these virtual workshops are uh, focused to help the students refocus, to make sure that they are um, where they need to be and where, in order for them to graduate on time. In addition, not just start anywhere, but be sure to meet where the students are, listen to their problems, understand, have empathy for what's happening. Meet the safety of these students because at the end of the day, they want to get a degree. They want to be great. They can also provide free tutoring, mentoring and counseling through virtual um, streams. They can provide resources for students to obtain um, food and water, housing assistance, and um, assistance in order to pay bills or any other necessities. It's important that they also be reconnected with the career services if they are not to help them prepare for the next um, step in their, in their career. And to also help individuals who have learning disabilities to help those individual learning disabilities who need the extra help, the extra opportunities to succeed. Next slide, please. So here's, here are some tips for college students. Self-advocate, always, always, always. Find someone that you can talk to to get the help you need, whether it be in classes, whether it be in at home, let them know you need help and be willing to, to accept that help. Every day, take some time to relax, to listen to positive words, positive affirmations, and to stay in a positive um, mindset. 
Now, one of the op great opportunities that are out there are virtual networking platforms. And one of the great network networking platforms that I'm a part of is National Research Mentoring Network. It's free. You get opportunity to meet with other scientists in industry as well as in government, government and in academia to help you along your path of becoming a successful um, STEM leader. In addition, take the time to meet with family virtually. There's great opportunity, opportunities to use these platforms to talk with family and friends and talk about the great times. Most importantly, take care of your mental health. Take care of emotional health and spiritual and physical. Remember, you are amazing and I am proud of you. Next slide, please. So you can reach me by email at robertslamanda at gmail.com, on Facebook, Science with Dr. Amanda Roberts, Twitter at 3 Amanda Roberts, Instagram, Science with Amanda Roberts, as well as my website. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Roberts. I'm gonna take a lot of that advice to heart, even though I'm no longer a college student. So I really appreciate it. Our next speaker is Dr. Stephen Thomas. He is director of the Maryland Center for Health Equity and professor of health policy and management in the School of Public Health. Dr. Thomas is one of the nation's leading scholars on community-based interventions to eliminate racial and ethnic health disparities, including obesity, diabetes, hypertension, HIV, AIDS, and violence. He is principal investigator of the Center of Excellence on Race, Ethnicity, and Disparities Research, funded by the NIH National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. This five-year, $5.9 million grant award launched in August 2012 includes teams of scientists conducting targeted research on obesity, vaccine acceptance, and men's health. Dr. Thomas is also principal investigator on the NIH NIMHD National Bioethics Research Infrastructure Initiative, Building Trust Between Minorities and Researchers, focused on delivery of scientifically sound and culturally relevant research with racial and ethnic minority populations. In 2014, he became Associate Director of the National Mentor Research Network, which is part of a $31 million consortium funded by the NIH Common Fund, focused on increasing racial and ethnic diversity of the biomedical and public health workforce. He has received numerous awards, including the Alonzo Smith Yearby Award from the Harvard School of Public Health for his work with people suffering the health effects of poverty. Welcome to you, Dr. Thomas. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Every now and then I'll have to give me a thumbs up. So here we are. Um, I think that the conversation we're gonna have at the end is so important, so I, I will um, be efficient. But I wanna start here because this notion of what is your dream, this image of Dr. King is something we need to, I think, lean into. Uh, COVID's taught us anything is that the, the the civil rights movement continues and it's in this space of health and public health in particular that we can really uh, hopefully find some new solutions next. And so, yes, I have been in this space of health disparities. I knew when I was hearing this language of of uh, pre pre-existing conditions that people of color were in the crosshairs of this pandemic. And yet here, here we are. Um, and uh, the previous uh, presenter talked about Tuskegee. Uh, this is the moment when the federal government finally apologized. Um, this was uh, May 16, 1997. Okay, study started in 1932, ended in 1972, not until May 1997, there was a, an official apology. Now I say all this because an apology means I'm sorry from a president who wasn't even alive in 1932. We need to move towards atonement, which means making things better. Next slide. And all of our efforts around racial and ethnic health disparities has taught us the, the, the fact that this cultural memory is out there. It's been spoken of many times. You see my virtual background behind me. I'm reminding us people, we've been here. 
during the AIDS epidemic, we, we ad addressed all of these very issues and we came up with very creative solutions. And you can see that window, you know it's the church. You can see the ribbon, you know it's HIV AIDS. But there is no such iconography for any of the work we're doing around uh, COVID. Maybe it's just too soon. We don't have the AIDS quilt. Maybe we don't have the ownership. We have to own this. Next slide. So I'm here to cause some trouble. Uh, I'll call it good trouble, but I think we're being much too kind. If we wanna help our friends in the federal government, if we wanna help our friends at the National Library of Medicine, if we wanna help our friends at uh, GIMS, we've got to critical critique what has just happened. And so I'm gonna take you into a hospital where I received my COVID vaccine and go ahead, JK, just make it full screen, but don't start it yet. I'm gonna take you into a hospital and we're talking about issues of racism, institutional racism, discrimination in healthcare. And I want you to put your racism lens eyeglasses on and tell me what you see. Hit play, JK. I don't hear the sound, brother. No sound, my man. Here we go. Now we'll do the technical thing. We'll let them get it together. It'll eat into my time, but that's okay. Because I want you to see what happens when you literally go and get the vaccine. And uh, I also want you to think about the very vulnerable communities that we're interested in serving and what they're gonna experience when they go into these settings. So the hesitancy in the community is legitimate. It has been earned. We know this. So I see my, our, our tech folks are working. Um, so in terms of our um, mentees, since we were talking about that, uh, you should know that right now, uh, all science is not taking place in a laboratory. In many ways, the warp speed has shown us this distinction between STEM and the other sciences that I think we need. STEM brought us a vaccine in almost like um, truly warp speed. Never has it been developed this fast. I just go to full screen and then uh, go ahead and hit Where I was on this day. Here we go. Because today I received my first coronavirus vaccine. So excited. I'm a teacher. I'm in the School of Public Health. We went to the website and teachers are listed as a priority. I'm here. And maybe it's just a coincidence that the hospital is located on Good Luck Road. So that's what I feel. I feel like I have good luck. I'm fired up and ready to go. Okay. Thank you. The election, the inauguration, the insurrection. And then I get my email that I can get my coronavirus vaccine. I mean, all that in a matter of days, I feel like I'm living through history. Get my driver's license back here. Let's, let's do the thing, let's do the thing. We all have our motivations. <laughs> that is true. And my motivation for getting the vaccine because I want to be around for the people I love. I want to be around to see graduations. I want to be around to go to the weddings. And unfortunately, even some of the funerals that I've missed because of this. All right, I'm going to give this back. I want to be around for all the things that we look forward to in life. And this is one way to turn the corner. I have to admit, I was a bit of a baby. I looked away. I couldn't look at the needle. Tell me when it's over. It's over. It's over. It's over. How was that? You did it already? I did it already. <laughs> and I can hardly tell where we did it, but I do right there. Okay? That's it. And for being such a great patient, you did the sticker. It was painless. I didn't even know it was done. Okay. They laughed. They had the same joy I did in receiving the vaccine. They had joy in giving it to me. Can I follow you? Yes, sir. Okay. So I think that sense of community is the silver lining around this pandemic. My options are? 11, 12, 13, and 16. Of February. Yep. What's your motivation to get it? But what's your motivation to 
hesitate. And Tuskegee comes up as the reason why many black people are afraid. That is true, but that's just the surface. Let's go a little bit deeper. And the deeper lesson is that the protections, you see all the paperwork I had to fill out? That was all to protect my privacy. Those are all part of the legacy of Tuskegee to protect people. That's the conversation we need to have. And then we need to share why we did it. I think it's real important that we try to give a sense of hope for a better day. I think we can reduce the fears. Okay, thank you so much. That was, uh, oh, oh, did you see the racism? Did you see the institutional racism? I know we haven't opened up, I'm setting you up. My point is what you saw was I was, what the health professionals looked like me. The health professionals had even local idiom language that they use that black people in this audience, we've got 288 people watching, understood. And I think we have to literally walk people through the process using visuals, using your cell phone and break down the mystery. We do have ethical responsibility. I'm gonna go quickly to the finish line, go ahead. We talked about the um, Belmont, go ahead, next slide, please. We talked about the Belmont principles um, in the aftermath of all these things, keep going. Um, we talked about the respect for persons, beneficence, stop right there, justice. I'm gonna add back up one, I'm gonna add on justice. Justice means those who bear the burden of research should not be denied the benefit. So throughout history, black bodies and brown bodies have been used in laboratories for the science and the research. I argument, our argument now should be that we should benefit from that science. So the real lesson from Tuskegee today in the, in the midst of COVID is that African-Americans should be a priority to receive the vaccine because the men in the Tuskegee study were denied access to the vaccine. Uh, next slide. And we'll keep going next slide. I'm just gonna show you one thing here. You know, what does it look like in the field to do this? Next slide. I'm so glad to meet the Library of Medicine. Please help me bring the Library of Medicine into the black barbershops and beauty salons. Next slide. This is our program called HAIR, Health Advocates in Reach and Research. We bring the health professionals and the message into the barbershop and so on. Next slide. No self-respecting black barber. Next slide. Whatever say, I'll get you in and out in 15 minutes. So here is a place where we can mobilize the trusted setting and influencers that African-American and Latinx communities uh, believe in. Next slide. And so uh, we hope that in the discussion, we can talk about how we take the questions from the community right when they're in the barber chair, in the salon chair, and then turn the answers into materials they understand whether it's using graphic artists, using uh, graphic novels, whether it's short videos, we have to meet them where they are. And that's what we're missing in my opinion. And I think we need to hammer our, our, our government agencies because we saw in the previous administration how we can be left on our own. Yes, we're all in this together. It's the same storm, but we are in different boats and many people of color are not in a boat at all. They're in, a, in an inner tube. You can go ahead and stop sharing. And I think that um, there must be an urgency, much greater urgency. We're being very kind and nice. You can uh, stop sharing, come back to the Hollywood squares and, um, and simply um, recognize that we have to build infrastructure in the community. And so I'll say to Dr. Gammy that community-based research has to be supported. And right now, many of our community-based researchers are not getting the support they need to advance in the careers in the academy. And, if we, and, and, and so that's the lesson. Warp speed got us a vaccine in record time. But the inability to vaccinate, that's the public health side. And that's the side that we must rebuild moving forward. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you.
so much. Um, and thank you to our entire panel for fascinating presentations. We are ready now to take your questions. Um, you can ask your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Just click down there and type your question in and we will address it to our panel. And um, I think our panelists are really looking forward to engaging with our audience today. So we have a number of great questions already. I'm gonna start with two that are related to vaccine hesitancy. And maybe Dr. Lin, you could, you could take these. The first question, um, the, the, um, the, uh, the writer would like to know whether you asked respondents if they had already had COVID-19. And a second related question is, um, this audience member is interested in knowing whether educational level has any role in um, the level of vaccine hesitancy. I mute myself. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. Those are great questions. And uh, in terms of the first question, uh, we did ask uh, whether a person has been uh, has, uh, has got a positive test, a, a PCR test, and uh, so. Um, and uh, we launched up in last April. So in May and June, and we got over half million on the users. And but over time, people last year people got tired, and then the number of users uh, dropped over time. And so the vaccine uh, question was uh, initiated last December. And so therefore, in last December, because we only had about thirty uh, hundred users. And so even though we have those questions, positive test questions in the app, but not, uh, not many people were tested positive. And uh, so it was the, among the users. And so, so that's why it is among the 30,000 people. And uh, so there are multiple reasons. Uh, one is the test is not widely available. Not everybody can get a test in some regions. And uh, also, and uh, so um, the uh, the the youth number of use, uh, users in December was much lower than the spring. So we need the help to increase the user base. Then we will get a more reliable result. And uh, among the limited people who got a positive test, among those 30,000 people, so far we found a no association as I showed in the result. I did not comment on that. And uh, so the second question about the education level. Uh, yes, I think we, we did include education level, and uh, but I did not have time to present the result. And so I will be happy to share the result uh, with the audience later. Thank you so much. And one more question for Dr. Lin. What assurances can you provide regarding privacy and security for users of the How We Feel app? This is an excellent question. And uh, the privacy and the security is high, high importance to us. And uh, so this study was approved by Harvard School Public Health IRB. And uh, so in the app, we don't ask people any private information, such as we don't ask people about their name, about email address. And we don't ask people about their um, con any contact information. And uh, for in terms of the geographical uh, location, uh, we don't record any geog geographic location of the users, uh, where the user is located, except at the, um, the zip code level. And uh, so, so therefore, and uh, the security level is very high. And also for the data which we downloaded and from the app, and when we download the data from the app, we only uh, uh, we put the data in the uh, Harvard uh, Research Computing Cluster that has security level three. So it's a very high security. So every step, we are very, very careful about the data security and privacy. And also we ask every participant using the app and sign a, a consent. So everybody is consented, yeah. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Lin, one more question and then I'll um, take you off the hot seat. Um, this last question is, um, why do you think there are such high hesitancy rates among healthcare workers? And this questioner is asking, do they know something that we don't? Oh, that's a great question. That's a, a so they have, there have been 
multiple articles and in the last month also reporting the hesitancy of the healthcare worker. So if you, I think there's one article appeared in uh, mid-December last year and uh, quoted the governor of Ohio State that they reported about something like a 50% to two third of the nursing home and the uh, healthcare workers were hesitant. And so I think there are multiple reasons. Definitely this uh, historical uh, medical uh, mistreatment is one of the reasons, and also the safety concerns. And uh, so because the vaccines are using the newer technology, the mRNA technology, and also this was done uh, you know, in a, sh a short period of time. So there were some concerns about the safeties and also there were concerns about a uh, side effect. And, uh, and also there are concerns about uh, like a mistrust, a mistrust of uh, the government. So there are multiple reasons. And so that's why we are, we are interested in understanding the reason better. So therefore the educational and outreach for effort can be more effective. So we are implementing questions about the reasons right now. Anna, yes. this is George Mensa. May I add just a little bit to that? I, I completely agree with what Dr. Lin said. There's one thing we recently learned out of a study from Israel, uh, that medical professionals are not all the same. Uh, and it turned out from that study that medical professionals who see COVID patients deal with vaccines on a routine basis, understand the safety and the development they tend to have fairly little hesitancy. But other medical professionals, and they included doctors, they included nurses, uh, who are a little bit removed from COVID patients and also removed for the infectious disease and vaccine era, uh, tend to have more hesitancy. The message for us is even that level of hesitancy can change. And so understanding why they're hesitant can help us really uh, address it, even within the medical profession. Thank you for that. Um, the next question I was going to ask went away. <laughs> um, okay, I'll move on to the next one. Um, so this is a question for Dr. Brennan. Um, this researcher wanted to know uh, why most scientists are reporting their sequencing data for SARS-CoV-2 to GISAID, you know, the, the, ge the genome database, instead of to the NCBI. Well, thank you very much for that question. And I want you to know that uh, Dr. Collins and um, uh, Dr. Cherry and myself have been spending a lot of time on this question in the last week to 10 days. Uh, for those in the audience, GISAID is a, a private uh, archive of sequence data. It, it, it was created around 2008 for, um, as a repository for the influenza virus. It's important because it draws a lot of national and national, international researchers. Um, it's a challenge because it is accessible only with permission and it does not interoperate with more public genomic resources such as INSDC, the International Nucleotide Sequence Database or the National Library of Medicine's ver is a contributor to the INSDC, which is GenBank and the SRA. I want to remind you that all uh, federally funded research in the US that, that uses sequences, all researchers are required to deposit their sequences into the National Library of Medicine re database, GenBank, um, to make it publicly accessible. So private researchers and researchers from around the world are certainly able to use our, our deposit, but often they will use GISAID primarily because it allows for protection of intellectual property by the depositor. And there are issues of, of um, understanding the value of, of a unique sequence uh, that might have certain implications for future therapeutic or vaccine development. We are working very closely with other funders around the world to say during this public health emergency, we need to find alternative ways to protect individual rights while promoting as much sharing of the genomic data as possible. With the rapid mutation of the genome sequence, in the coronavirus, it is critical that we have access to emerging variants as quickly as possible. Thank you for your question. Oh, and I apologize to the interpreter. I spoke too fast. Thank, thanks so much. I, uh, I retrieved the question that I had lost before, um, and it's an important one. So, and really many of you can answer. So whichever one of you would like to answer, please just go ahead. If you have had COVID and recovered, 
is it still necessary to get the vaccine this year? If maybe Dr. Memsa, would you like to, to answer that one? Uh, yes, Anna, I, I would give it a try. Uh, it's a very important question, and the best answer I can give is it depends. Uh, if you don't have any testing, so you don't know the level of antibody titus you've developed from your infection, especially if you don't know how far you've been removed from your infection, I would think the evidence now would suggest that you should get the vaccine. Now, if you uh, have great access to healthcare since your infection, you know what your titers are and your antibodies level are as high as we saw in the vaccine studies, some people could make an argument that your body already recognizes that virus, has developed an antibody, and maybe the recommendation for vaccination is not as strong as if you didn't have titers. I should say that I'm not speaking from data here just interpreting the best that we, we can say. What we don't know, because we haven't studied it long enough, is if you had the infection and even if you have titers, how long those titers would remain high enough to protect you from another infection. If all else fails, you cannot go wrong in getting the vaccination. And I think until we have definitive evidence of what to do, our recommendation should be you should follow the, the advice of your public health officers in that area. And if that fails, you're better off getting the vaccine than not getting it at all. Thank you. Um, and this one is sort of um, a, a comment, but I thought I would run it by Dr. Thomas to see what he thinks. Um, this audience member said that you know, that she, he or she would also like to add that African American distrust of the current medical system is ongoing because of the current treatment we receive as well as historical mistreatment. Um, so I wondered if you would agree with that. I, I, I totally agree. It just simply reinforces what, what the mother wit, you know, the word of mouth that, and, and we should see it not as a, a problem. We should see it as a form of self-protection. Our job should not be to disarm them. Our job should be to listen, finally, listen, actually listen, and then not try to come up with, what's my message to get you to do something? Simply listen. Most people want to do the right thing. I think we also have to, when we hear the community tell us the challenges that they have faced when they come into our systems, we, yeah, no matter where you are in the totem pole, we need to take that message back and run it up all the chain to the presidents, the provosts. We need to tell our leadership in our institutions what the community is experiencing and what they're saying. So yes, Tuskegee is part of the cultural memory, but it, it was the bad treatment my uncle got yesterday at the hospital that makes me hesitant. Uh, it was that newspaper story of the physician who had to use FaceTime to describe her plight and she died and she's an MD. So that said, doesn't matter what your degrees are. When you put that gown on, you're just another black person. So the issues of racism, unconscious bias, discrimination is real. And we in the health professions, guess what? We need to look in the mirror and address the history of our institutions. This is not you personally, but we bear the burden who have come before us. So when we build back, Nobody should want to go back to so-called normal. For black people, brown people, that was not normal. We've got to build back better with insights that we're learning right now from the COVID uh, pandemic. If we can't do it now, we'll never be able to do it. This is the time. Anna, can I jump in on that before I have to leave? Um, there have been studies um, that have shown that patients who have come in uh, to the emergency room um, for treatment, say for a leg fracture or an ankle fracture, based on race, um, the amount of care or quality of care and the amount of pain medication, something as simple as what medications you receive to treat the pain um, varies depending on your ethnicity. 
And unfortunately, once again, African-Americans fall at the bottom of that totem pole, meaning that the, the physician who is responsible for taking care of you, the nursing staff that is responsible for helping the physician take care of you, they are treating a, an African-American female or an African-American male with Tylenol or um, something not very strong or potent, whereas their white counterpart gets morphine or Dilaudid to treat their pain. And that those are real concerns. And that all again, harkens back to all the things that we've been talking about throughout the um, webinar today. And Doc, let's be careful and mindful as more and more things go online and more and more things are driven by algorithms, that there can be bias and discrimination in the algorithm. And now when it, when it, when it actually comes out and is manifest, uh, Dr. George says, well, hey, it wasn't me, it was the machine. We've got, a, who's programming these machines? What's the diversity of that group? What insights do they have? And whether it's pain medication or why so many black and brown people with type two diabetes are having fingers and toes amputated, the numbers are off the chart. That was before COVID. So if you didn't care about me then, why should I think you care about me now? That's what we have to grapple with. That's our opportunity right now. And to use this technology, the Zoom technology to bring the community voices into these spaces. Anna, could I add briefly to it, please? The, the, these are really crucial conversations. And I should say that, yes, I completely agree. However, I think we also have a responsibility to add that there are protections that have been put in place. We just need to make sure that they are done. At the National Institute of Health, at the CDC, at the FDA, at the CMS, there are individuals who are just as passionate about this as we are, and we're doing our best to help support, develop, and test strategies that can help eliminate these uh, disparities. The mistake we will make is if we don't acknowledge that they exist, and if we don't name it that it exists, but then we shouldn't stop there. We should say that we now have good evidence that when you actually provide the systemic corrections, the appropriate policies. These are not just individuals who are racist. Very often is the systemic processes that we need to develop structures to against. And I really want to give credit to the American Heart Association, the American Medical Association. They all have equity programs. We just know that it's not enough. We need to do more and more. But, but it first must begin with recognizing that it exists and then saying there are protections in place. We just need to make sure that happens. So please join us in trying to solve these problems. And George, even the hospitals are starting equity programs. This is a very good development, but we were frightened, George. Allison, we were afraid because the previous administration muzzled you in ways that we had no idea was possible. And that means that we on the outside need to have structures in place so that we can support those of you on the inside. Very, very important. That's what COVID has taught us. Thank you, appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and here's a question actually for Drs. Mensa and Dr. Thomas. Um, how effective do you believe the requirement for clinicians to take implicit bias training as continuing education will be? <laughs> Okay, I'll be the outsider on that. I'm gonna do some. I'm gonna do some good trouble here. Um, I just got an, a a ping from my institution saying, "You haven't completed your online sexual harassment training." Oh, I got to do that. Okay, let me go in and do that. I get the spirit of it, but to do the online bubble quiz does not make me anything other than aware of what the legal issues are. It may not make me any more sensitive to the issues of microaggressions against women or other things to be addressed. So if it's approached as a online quiz, you know, like city training, I think it is important, but not sufficient. And if COVID's taught us anything, we need more immersive training. And one of the things that we're doing is working with uh, virtual reality companies, uh, software uh, industry, 
to literally build a virtual environment where health professionals can be retrained, where they can go through that cultural competence training, but then come into the simulator to practice. You wouldn't think of an airline pilot flying a plane without spending hours in a simulator. Well, guess what? The technology is good enough now that we can have virtual reality simulators where the health professionals literally interacting with that composite African-American and can practice these difficult conversations in a safe space. Nobody wants to take a quiz and say, oh, does that mean I'm a racist? It gets very personal. We need to reimagine the training and in the name of efficiency, come up with more than just online tests. Okay, George, I threw the ball to you now. Very, very, very well said. I don't know how I could top that. So I, I should say yes, completely agree. And I would emphasize something you said. They are necessary, but they are not enough. We can't just forget and not do them because they may not be as effective as we want. They're necessary, but we need to do more. I would just mention something maybe in a cryptic way, but I'm sure all of you would understand. And it reflects the real value of policy and policy change to address structural issues. Three weeks ago, I could not talk about implicit bias training or talk about racism or talk about structural racism because there was a policy against it. Today, there isn't. That policy has changed. And so we really need to think about, in addition to doing these tests, we need to find ways to put in long lasting policy changes that make the changes permanent. So thank you, Dr. Thomas, for saying it. You, you said it beautifully. Great. Um, this next question could really go to any of you. Um, she's asking for individuals who are not medical providers, do you have recommendations or resources to prevent vaccine hesitancy? When members in my community directly ask for guidance, I want to help, but I don't know where other than the CDC site. Thank you. You leave, you leave space, I'm gonna fill it. So I'm gonna yeah. be quiet for a while, but you've got better jump in there. <laughs> you know, in any one family, uh, the person in the family network could end up being the, the health professional. They may be a nurse's aide in a nursing home, but because in their family network, they're the ones in that health space, they become the actual health expert for that family. Imagine if those people had a connection to the National Library of Medicine and all those resources we just learned about. Imagine if those folks could tap into the COVID prevention network and all the materials they're developing. This is our tax dollars at work, but people can't find it. We have to curate better. People go on and type something into Google. Guess what they get? A lot of disinformation. And nobody could have imagined that the largest source of disinformation in the name of COVID was coming from the White House. That's not me, that's the data. So we have to really push hard against the fact that there are organized forces out there trying to confuse our communities, actively trying to spew disinformation in our communities. We have to be just as aggressive with the right information. And if that means that the local barber becomes somebody who can direct you to NLM literature, great. Imagine going into the barbershop and having a National Library of Medicine kiosk. That's my future. That's my building back better. And, and, and in, uh, case, in case you don't, you don't believe what Dr. Thomas just said, let me, let me share with you that there is actually a published study that the NIH, the Heart, Lung and Blood Institute uh, funded working with black barbershops and pharmacies where blood pressure control was much better than usual care. And so this is effective. I loved it when Dr. Thomas said, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could bring the National Library of Medicine and SEAL and the barbershop together? And I immediately started thinking, so I'm gonna have a conversation with Dr. Brennan uh, and see what, what, we can, what, what we can do. But, but these are wonderful, making sure that we bring this to the community not ask the community to come to us and come find the information, get it ready and take it where they are and meet them where they are. 
I'd like to comment just a minute and thank uh, both Dr. Thomas and Dr. Mensah for their nice comments about my place, which I'm very proud of. But remember that being in life with people is being in conversation with people. And our best chance to encourage people to reduce their fears is through the conversation. So these opportunities to move into the community are opportunities not just to put a billboard up, but to build a place for con for talking. Thank you. Actually, I would recommend I would recommend for individuals to contact and find out the website for your community public health community. So, for example, I work for Tarrant County Public Health, and we have resources that are available when you walk in, as well as online. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to add one more question that's right in the vein of what Dr. Brennan was talking about. It's from an anonymous attendee. She writes, I'm a black woman in California who will lead a vaccine discussion with my family this weekend. I'm nervous. There will be a mixture of vaccine hesitant relatives who plan to participate. Would the panel please offer advice on how to structure this conversation and to offer framing questions to keep the conversation constructive? I'm just going to open that up generally to all of you again. Well, I, I think that's such, I'm, I'm so glad a question like that came in. It wasn't a clinical question. It was a question about, hey, I've now got some new information. I've been here in this webinar. I got to talk to my family and they're on different sides of the issue. I'm nervous. What should I do? So number one, I think you should recognize, don't think of it as one and done, that you have to answer everything all at once and listen, and then ask questions. What's your motivation for your hesitancy? What's the reasons? And start collecting those reasons. Say, you know what? I'm gonna get the answers from Dr. Fauci for you. I'll be right back. And then you come to us and we'll curate those questions. And now you get it back to your family. Find out, do they have internet access? Find out what the barriers are they have to get to information. Now we're talking about a long-term change of the culture in that family network. But you don't have to have an answer to everything. It's okay to say, I don't know, but I'm going to find out for you because I met all these scientists on this webinar and they're going to help me. I think that gives you more encouragement for how a role that you can play as a non-expert to help your family. I want to echo uh, Dr. Thomas's comment about listening. You need to start with listening. Sometimes it's because people want to tell you something, so it gets it over with quickly. They get it out on the table. Sometimes it gives you some cues about clues about what what do they really care about. Um, we do know that from from literature about other vaccine circumstances that explaining that the vaccine is a good idea or why it's safe. Is doesn't always encourage people to participate. Sometimes actually makes them a little more reluctant. Helping people to see the value of what they're doing for the people they care about. This will make Nana safe. This will make it easier for me to give you a hug. That is, it might be a, a positive way to go. And I would like, I'd like to actually clarify one misconception that I know has been floating around lately, which is that the current vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer, are, are made, with, there's a fear that they're made from stem cells. They are not made from stem cells. These are not stem cell vaccines. So sometimes uh, some of our more observant religious friends and, and family members are worried that they're violating an ethical principle. This is not a stem cell based vaccine. Thank you. Well, the other thing that comes when you say, oh, it's an mRNA, they say, well, that affect my DNA. So then you have a situation, do you give a, a, a basic course in microbiology or virology? It's a natural question. Eso sería una pregunta natural. Because people don't want things okay. put in them. They may take a survey, but when you start injecting- okay. mejor necesita tomar a gente, digamos, you really have to have not only trust, but trustworthiness. La confianza, pero vale la pena la confianza. I would like to make a comment. I think uh, I agree with what has been said very well. I think the listening, 
uh, I agree with what has been said. I thought this is the listening is critically important. The other thing I want to add is I, I think uh, the communication is critically important. So given that um, one thing I learned uh, is uh, through the um, pandemic is um, when the scientists talk to the general public, it's very important to avoid using jargons as the people can understand. And also, like this also is a good opportunity that for both the seal and the national, library, that. Uh, national library of medicine and other NIH consortia to okay. develop some kind of uh, a training session for the volunteer like this woman and who want to help the community, but has a difficulty in learning how to communicate. So I think this, those will be the okay. So we need to train the community leader to help them how to communicate the vaccine, um, vaccine education and to the general public. I think this will be a great uh, initiative and um, NIH can take a lead on. Yeah, and Dr. Lin, that's why the barbershop beauty salon in the Black community can be so important. It is a place where those social norms, those conversations happen, and people can build up their skill set around the conversation. Now it spreads. Now, my friends who go to supercuts and hair cutlery, they, they, they say they never talk. Yeah. <laughs> they, they read the paper the whole time they're in the chair. But George knows no matter how much hair you have, you're going to be in the Black barbershop all day. Am I right, brother? <laughs> You're absolutely right. <laughs> You're absolutely right. But by the way, I just put in the chat box the link to uh, the NIH website. I'm going to add the link to the Coronavirus Prevention Network. But the important thing is, one, I was just delighted to hear that you are nervous. I was nervous when I was coming on this panel. It's good. It gets you prepared and ready. And I'll add what Dr. Brennan added. This is a conversation. It shouldn't end with just that one meeting. And as you go on these websites, please keep in mind that not all family members are comfortable with the internet. Not all of them are willing to go on the web. Sometimes they will prefer to have an 800 number where they can call and hear somebody talk with them. And so as you go through these, putting that, those together as additional resources could be very helpful. And if there is a SEAL team in your state, please reach out to JK and his team because they're doing a wonderful job. We have a lot of information we can share with you. Thank you. So much. Okay, this is going to be our final question. We can spend about two minutes answering it and then we'll, we're gonna have to go to closing remarks. But um, an, an anonymous attendee would like to know how important is it, especially for the Black community, to inform the public about the ways that clinical trials are regulated in terms of ethics and safety now, that was not the case during Tuskegee. Although this does not help the fact that Black people are still mistreated in medicine. So could bringing up something like this, you know, inform some of the conversations we have with vaccine hesitant family members? Let me just say quickly, if we don't get this right, we will lose ground on so many levels. We will lose ground on who's taking the flu shot. We will lose ground on who's willing to be part of a clinical trial. This is our chance to get it right. And uh, again, I think it's simply is taking time uh, to bring this message into settings where the community is and then doing research they want. You know what happens, Dr. Lynn, after you build that trust, they start saying, hey, Dr. T, my uncle just lost his foot to diabetes. How can we prevent these amputations? Well, that's not what I do, but I know people who do do that. When they start asking questions from us as researchers, we need to respond and we can't wait for an RFP no, to come out to respond. So we need rapid response teams that can respond to the community's questions that have research implications without waiting for a grant announcement. So that's a whole new reimagination of the kinds of, of institute infrastructure we need in the community that is not so tied to grant cycles. And, and let me also add that um, I, I think it's extremely important to begin with listening, but if all we do is listen and maybe even agree with them with the concerns they have, then we reinforce their fears about all the terrible things that exist in care today. We should listen, but we then should emphasize the privacy protections 
uh, and the ethical and safety issues that are ensured in every NIH funded research. I think that can go a long way in boosting the confidence that our family members and the general public have in the research system and in the safety of the product so that they can accept. Thank you. And George, you put an article about in the New England Journal that showed that working in the barbershops work to lower blood pressure, but it still lives in the journal. We have to take the science out of the journals and implement it. Because the people say to me, hey, weren't you here? You took blood last time. You took my pressure. I'm still sick. Where's the solution? We have to implement the science, translate it into culturally tailored, community-based intervention. Then we have some credibility. Dr. Thomas, that's why the name of the center I direct at NIH is called the Center for Translation Research and Implementation Science. That's point number one. Point number two, that's also the reason why the mantra for the NIH, the National Institutes of Hope, is turning discovery into health. I so we it. move from taking the research evidence and we find ways to implement uh, in routine day-to-day -day care in communities. Where have you been all my life? We gotta work <laughs> together. <laughs> so with, with those words, uh, I, I think uh, you know we are at 1.30. Uh, I want to take this opportunity First of all, uh, to thank Aina for moderating this session uh, wonderfully, navigating through all of the presentations and questions. We do realize that there are a lot of questions that are not answered. One thing we are going to do is our team is going to collect all these questions. We will pose those questions to the right panelists, and we will try to respond back to you. Uh, you know, based on uh, we know uh, you know who you are. Uh, it, asking those questions. So we will try to be responsive. Uh, we, we also will be able to uh, share this entire video. It is recorded. It will be put on a YouTube channel uh, that if you want to uh, revisit a part of the conversation, you can always go back to that. Uh, so that's what I wanted to mention. I want to thank all the audience for having uh, stayed here for two hours uh, to listen to all these experts. More importantly, I want to thank each one of the panelists uh, each one is a very busy person, but they have taken two hours of their uh, day to be able to you know, participate in this and address a lot of these questions. These are very important topics that we have covered today. I think it has opened up uh, a lot of conversations that we can have further too. Uh, so I really thank all of you. I hope all of us have learned something uh, from this webinar. And once again, uh, uh, from my team to all of the participants, all the panelists, thank you very much. Wear your mask. Thank you. Wash your hands. Stay away from crowds. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.